you know, whenever I got out of the, uh, you know, corporate environment in healthcare, which is the most overregulated industry in the United States, um, I got creative and that's where I kind of shot myself in the foot. I didn't get any deals for four months because I was texting and calling and doing all this fun, creative stuff. Then I sent more mail and I got five more deals that made me another hundred grand, um, you know, right after that. So where I've shifted my approaches, you know, don't get creative until you've worked a system to death. Uh, you know, copy and paste what other people are doing because it works. You don't need to be creative in real estate to make tons and tons of money. Uh, you just need to do what works and replicate it and, you know, outsource your, you know, and delegate um, all the stuff you're bad at. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Mason McDonald is a former hospital CEO turned full-time land flipper that utilizes systems, people, and processes to earn massive profits and invest into commercial real estate. Mason, welcome to the show. Sam, it's so good to be here. Absolutely, Mason. The pleasure is mine. There are three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell me where did you start, where are you now, and how did you get there? Heck yeah. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I was a hospital CEO that stumbled across land flipping. Uh, bought my first deal in November of 2021, uh, sold it in early 2022, uh, and made a profit of 115000 on my very first deal, which allowed me to prematurely, I had uh, quit my job and uh, jump into this full time. So now, um, you know, a year and a half in, created a business that should have an EBITDA um, right around one and a half to $2 million this year. And, um, you know, have a full time employee that's managing it for me. And now I'm, you know, focusing on bigger, better stuff like commercial real estate, raising money, lending money, all that fun stuff. Man, that's really cool. Um, let's talk. Let's talk about this. I see here for those of you that don't know, uh, and I've never actually talked about this on the show. I always just ask this question just to get to know our guests. I always ask what's one a fun factor, a surprising view about you and the guest will share that. Uh, with me there in the in the kind of onboarding section. And it said that you were a hospital CEO at the age of 26. I, I was and I had the blood pressure and health related issues of someone that was, uh, you know, 62 instead of 26. Right, right. What? How does one become a hospital CEO at 26? I mean, yeah, so I, I you know, I, I followed the traditional route. Uh, you got a good undergraduate degree, got a master's degree. Uh, and then worked my way up for, you know, a large hospital management corporation went from, you know, being a resident to having 90 employees in my second year uh, to having, you know, uh, I was COO in my third year and then uh, CEO in my fourth year got the job offer when I was 26, uh, had just added a lot of value to the company had, um, you know, younger, more innovative approach to, you know, increasing profit, reducing expense and treating your employees and patients right. So uh, yeah, had a, a lot of success in corporate America, which is why people think I'm crazy that I, you know, made it to the top and jump jump ship, uh, you know, a year after being a CEO. Yeah. So let me, I'm, I'm bad at math here, Mason, and I'm just doing, working back 26 minus four years working at the hospital puts you at 22. How did you get an undergrad, a master's degree and all of that by the age of 22? You, what year did you graduate or how old were you when you graduated high school? I was a uh, 17 when I graduated high school. My my parents just started me started me in school early. Uh, I don't know if it was I was smart or had too much ADD and they needed to get me out of the house. So um, school was always kind of easy for me. Uh, and uh, but I'm I'm more of the entrepreneurial business type, which is why you know I wanted to be a doctor uh, originally mm -hmm. and made that pivot my senior year of college to you know I have an undergraduate neuroscience degree with a pre med concentration that. Uh, you know, be, beyond being able to sound fancy and sound smart, um, never use it anymore. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I was I was always young. Man, Didn't drink that's... alcohol until my senior year of high, uh, college. So <laughs> good Legally. for you. There's a lot to be said for that, man. That's um, that's a lot of moving moving pieces. And yeah, good for you. You're a lot smarter than I am. I promise you that. But you got to the top and you found out there's nothing there, and you said, okay. Uh, yeah, to go do land flipping. How did you stumble across that? And why land flipping versus the 1000 other possible ways that you can enter the real estate space? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Made, so made it to the top. And I was I'm a healthy guy, you know, active, decent diet and everything hypertensive stage two blood pressure for you know, people listening that my blood pressure was running 165 over 100, um, which is uh, 
you know, and I, I worked in a hospital. Um, so that's not not a good look if the CEO is, you know, dying from health conditions in their 20s um, from, you know, stress. I right. was working all the time, sleeping none. So uh, always invested in or interested in real estate, listened to all the Bigger Pockets episodes, read, you know, 100 books about real estate and everything and just couldn't get started. I'd saved up some money. I uh, was actually going to go invest in a syndication opportunity for a townhome development in Colorado Springs. Uh, and the guy that was pitching it also told me that he flips land and he was making about 60 grand a month uh, on his notes that he owner financed on land. And I said, uh, well, that's more money than the 8% in three years that you're promising me on this syndication deal. So, you know, did did what, uh, you know, everyone should do is I invested in education and land flipping. And yeah, that first deal kind of broke my brain of making 100, you know, 114, five or 115 grand on my very first deal. So uh, yeah, that right there broke my brain and made me realize, oh crap, I can make a lot more money, uh, with a lot less stress and a lot less work, um, you know, flipping land. Right, right. No, that's, uh, that's really, really cool. Is it, was it the gambler's curse where the first time you go and gamble, you make a pile, pile of money. And then from then on, you just get, just get, get it handed to you. Or have you found a way to repeat those sort of return profiles over and over? Uh, repeat over and over. Um, but with that being said, you know, I, I stopped uh, doing what made sense whenever I do it. So I mean, I, I target people that have owned land for a long period of time, and I direct mail market. And, you know, whenever I got out of the, uh, you know, corporate environment and healthcare, which is the most overregulated industry in the United States, um, I got creative. And that's where I kind of shot myself in the foot. I didn't get any deals for four months, because I was texting and calling and doing all this fun, creative stuff. Then I sent more mail and I got five more deals that made me another hundred grand, um, you know, right after that. So where I've shifted my approaches, you know, don't get creative until you've worked a system to death, uh, you know, copy and paste what other people are doing because it works. You don't need to be creative in real estate to make tons and tons of money. Uh, you just need to do what works and replicate it and, you know, outsource your, you know, and delegate um, all the stuff you're bad at. Right. Well, let's talk. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get to that. How did you educate yourself on this space? Yeah, I, I took one of those land flipping courses and then, you know, read the books on it, you know, the dirt rich by Mark Podolsky and, you know, listened to all the podcasts and everything. So um, paid for a course and uh, love it. You know, my, my mentor who, you know, took the course, we own a commercial building together. He's a good friend and everything. But I, as I was going through it, I was like, man, I feel like I just bought snake oil at the County fair. Cause uh this doesn't seem legitimate, legitimate. It doesn't seem real. But. Right, right. It's funny because I was explaining for those of you, again, who are listening that they don't know everything. Of course, we don't talk about everything we get involved in because some of it's just stuff that's, uh, you know, uh, there's, the, there's the investments we talk about to our investor base. And then there's the stuff that I do on the side that's just kind of like, hey, this is fun to, uh, you know, to go invest in. And land is one of those, one of those things where it's like, oh, hey, you know what? There is an opportunity to generate sizable returns inside of the land space. But what, what were some of the things maybe in those first four months? I know you mentioned, um, you mentioned that you were trying to get creative. You were doing cold, or you were doing cold calls. You were doing all the different texting, all this different stuff. And you figured out that everybody in the land space says, just go back to direct mail. Yeah. So, so what, 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 I guess, how much money and how much mail did you send before you ever got your first deal? Uh, I sent 1200 pieces of mail to make that, first deal happen. And I'd gotten other deals, but um, I passed up on them because I, I didn't think the returns would be as decent. I mean, even now I've got probably two or 300 in our cold lead section where we could make money on it. Um, but, you know, if it's, you know, buy for 3000, sell for, you know, 5000 after, you know, title costs, which I insure every purchase and everything like that, it's not worth it, which is why I go for the you know, the two deals I was talking about, you know, just before the show started, we paid 150 for each of them. So, you know, 300 total, and we're putting them on the market, one for 450 and one for 275. You know, so it's it's easier to make 100 grand at once than it is to make, you know, two grand 100 times or right. you can tell I'm not good at math. So it's, two, two, which is why big numbers, times. I'm like, I don't understand big numbers. Let's do more big numbers. <laughs> right. You got to take your shoes off for that one. Hey, uh, so let's talk about this. There's a hundred different strategies, even inside of the land flipping space. There's people that buy infill lots. There's people that buy rural only. There's people that, you know, buy, like you're talking about commercial development sites. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different strategies there. Have you honed in on one in particular? 
So not exactly. Um, I stay away from kind of the recreational land um, just because that's going to you know, typically sit for a while and you have to do, you know, a seller finance deal to make it make sense, uh, which I, I like the quick return on cash. Um, so but all that to say, uh, to me, it, it's just math. I don't care if it's industrial or commercial or vacant residential. If if there's transaction volume in the area, uh, you know, meaning properties are selling in the last 30, 60, 90 days. Um, and if I can get a legitimate comparable analysis from a local realtor that says, hey, it's worth this much, um, then it's just, you know, a returns game of, okay, I'm, you know, which I, I attempt to double the money from like a HUD to HUD perspective of, you know, buy for 150, sell for 300 type of stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I, I bu I've built out my business to have both the the volume business of the, you know, 10, 15 K profit deals and the vacant, you know, the vacant land and the infill lots and the, you know, nice subdivisions and Colorado or Arizona is where we work primarily, um, as well as some of these larger deals where it takes more time, where it's, you know, a luxury buyer of, you know, we, we got one that just hit the market a few weeks ago, paid 350, have it on the market for 675, where it's kind of a one of a kind product. So that'll take a few months to sell, but if you can kind of stagger your business and also use other people's money. I don't use my own money in deals anymore. Mm. Um, you know, it's that, that's kind of how we built the business. So well, Jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. Let's talk about that. And, and, and I like the idea you know, you're talking about the volume business and then also doing the bigger, the bigger deals. Cause you gotta, I'd imagine you gotta, you gotta catch the, the, any fish that makes sense, small fish with a big fish and, and, and help you know, take those down. But how do you, how do you manage all that? And then I want to get into the money side of things. So yeah. how do you manage it from a people and processes perspective, because there's a lot of mail to send. There's a lot of data to dig through. There is a lot of phone calls to return and or answer. There are title companies, there's money wire. I mean, there's just all these little, it, it almost boils down to a lot of administrative stuff. I would imagine. How do you oh, manage yeah. that? It, it, it adds up. So, um, you know, for, for anyone in manufacturing or healthcare that's listening, I have a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, which is a process improvement methodology, um, you know, founded by Toyota. So obsessed with efficient processes that reduce waste and eliminate variation. So um, I, I pull the data myself now. Um, and since I have such a wide net that I cast, it doesn't take me a lot of time. Um, I send neutral letters. I don't do the blind offers like a lot of people do. You know, I send postcards. I'm the guy that sends the the silly postcard of, you know, I want to buy your land for cash, you know, stop paying your property taxes, get paid for your land, stuff like that. So that doesn't take um, a lot of time to send, you know, five, 10, 15,000 letters a month. Uh, I have a full-time acquisition manager that's salaried plus commission um, where, you know, paying him, you know, not, not an overly competitive salary, but a very substantial commission uh, to manage every other aspect of the business. And, He's way smarter and way better at it than I am. So he manages it all. We have a call once a week kind of going through the leads and everything. And um, he sends me stuff for deal approval. And then he submits it to title and coordinates with the realtor and everything like that. So for me, it's kind of just, uh, hey, send a wire this date, which, you know, go online, send a wire really quickly. And then, uh, you know, sign any necessary documents with the title company. Um, so it's it's definitely administrative stuff that down the road I want to outsource when I feel more comfortable, uh, you know, because he he just started about a month and a half ago. Um, but yeah, I, I I hate to say it, it sounds as easy as it is, but it, it, it is relatively easy to keep it managed, you know, pull the data from PropStream. I use Pebble as my CRM, you know, which you need a CRM if you're doing this much volume. Uh, otherwise, you're going to do what I did, which I used Excel for the first nine months. Um, and I lost all sorts of leads because I might be decent Excel, but, uh, you know, if you have a crayon box CRM that makes it super easy to, to do everything, do that. So uh, that's kind of the highest level of how I keep it organized. How did you find your lead man, or I'm going to call me your lead manager, your acquisitions manager. How did you find that person? Yeah, I, uh, I, I posted on LinkedIn that I was hiring. Um, I've got a pretty big professional network on, on LinkedIn and God, I got, 20 or 30 applications within the first week or two. So um, of all of them, I, I looked at who would make me the most uncomfortable to hire. Uh, and it was by far this guy, because he's got 20 plus, six, 20 plus years of experience in real estate and, you know, uh, commercial, you know, finance, you know, doing finance for big banks, doing land acquisition and uh, multifamily acquisition for large companies. And he runs his own syndication business on the side. So I was like, this guy makes me really uncomfortable to hire because he's way smarter than me, uh, which is always what I recommend doing is, you know, hire people smarter than you. And it's going to break break your mind and change all the paradigms you have because 
uh, you know, then, then you don't realize what's possible. Why, why I love that. Thank you. Thank you for giving the clarity on who you hire and why. And I, I haven't really heard it expressed that, um, succinctly to hire, hire someone that makes you uncomfortable. I think that's really, really cool. Talk to me about the types of sellers that you find. Why, why are these people selling this land at discount? And then, um, we'll start there. Yeah. So I try to reduce and simplify everything as much as I can. Um, I'm a pawn shop for land. I buy land for cheap and I sell it for more. Um, I have people that are motivated sellers and I have people that are unmotivated sellers, where for me, it's not an emotional decision. It's a math decision um, of whether the return makes sense. So why people sell to me? Uh, you know, I, I I think we're a legitimate business where we can send proof of funds. You know, so many people aren't going to close deals. Um, you know, and there's plenty of deals I haven't closed, but you're able to communicate and say, hey, this just doesn't fit our buy box. Sorry, you know, I can refer you to someone else. So um, I've had sellers as sophisticated as uh, former hedge fund man managers out in Connecticut um, to as unsophisticated as someone that inherited this land that their family's owned for a hundred years. So um, it's just whether or not the price works for them of uh, a lot of people, um, you know, and depending on your marketing campaign and your tactics and everything, you know, I, I went hard and heavy on the property tax marketing campaign and people were like, oh, shoot, uh, you know, property taxes just went way up in Colorado. Um, I want to get rid of this land and stop paying it. So um you know, we come up with a price that's fair. And I always tell everyone or you know, my acquisition manager now tells everyone of, hey, if you want top dollar, go to a realtor. If you want quick cash and convenience, come to us. You know, let us get this headache off your hands. You know, we'll solve your probate problems. We'll solve whatever problems you have. Um, and, you know, then you won't have to think about it anymore. It's the same reason people use a pawn shop of, you know, they, you know, had a divorce or they had some something or something and they don't want to deal with selling it themselves. They're going to just get rid of it to get it off their mind. So. Right. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Same as same pawn shops or uh, even the um, estate sale analogy where yeah. it's just like bring them in, they auction everything off and then you're done. Oh, yeah. So it's uh, it's not always the motivated seller of, you know, I've had people that are like, hey, I need to claim a loss this year. You know, I'll sell it to you at a discount to claim a loss. So, uh, you know, and, and, you know, the person I'm referencing that did that, uh, you know, we did a, you know, I bought two pieces of land from him. Um, you know, I had offered him over over double of what, uh, you know, he, he, we ended up walking away with, and, you know, that's making me, I don't know, another six figures on those two deals. That's awesome. Let's talk about the money side of it. You mentioned that you don't use your own money anymore. You use none of your own money or you predominantly use other people's money. I use other people's money. So I, I, I have, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 that I'm selling right now that I have my own cash in right now. Uh, but for me, I think it's this, uh, it's this difficult balance for someone that has, you know, a relatively high level of understanding of finance of, you know, I, I know having a ton of cash on hand is not great, but me feeling super liquid helps me sleep better at night. Sure. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to give up money in the deal to help, you know, the three F's, the friends, families, and fools investing with me, um, make insane returns where I had an investor just make 60 per 62% cash on cash return in 71 days. You annual, annualize that, that's over a thousand percent just doing a JV deal with me. Um, so it's exciting to be able to help those people. And then, yeah, so w whenever all of these other ones sell that I have my own cash in, I just, I, I won't use my own cash for anything besides marketing expense, mm -hmm. um, you know, and just general OPEX within the business uh, to help me sleep better at night. There's more than enough money for everyone to make a ton of money in this. And if, you know, if I sleep better and my returns are less, uh, that's a win for me. I, I didn't leave a hard job to go get another hard job. Right, right. Understood that, man. Tell me, tell me this. What's a what's been the common structure that you've set up with your JV partners? How do you how do you guys take that down, and what do you guys find is fair? Yeah, it, it varies on the property and kind of the uh, capital invested, but um, they they're basically funding the entire deal, uh, give or take a few hundred bucks if closing costs come in a little higher, something like that. Um, and I, I do varying profit splits from, you know, 90, 10, uh, you know, 10 to the investor, 90 to me, um, all the way up to 50, 50, where, uh, to me, if I get a deal under contract then it's a big one and I don't have, you know, the cash or refuse to put the cash in the deal, you know, I'll give up more of a profit split than it's probably smart. So, um, and, and, and the point I'm making on that is part of the reason why I'm able to have success in this business where a lot of people are focusing on the desert squares where you buy for 500 and sell for 1500, um, and can take, take these big deals as one, one, my investor networks couldn't do it without them. Um, but two people will realize and land. One of the reasons it's such a hard niche to get into is you're not going to be able to really get access to institutional capital 
if you go to a bank and ask them for a loan um, on, 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 on a land flip, they're going to laugh at you where it doesn't matter how much money I made since the, the asset class is different, which is also a pro because I'm not paying capital gains taxes or short-term capital gains taxes. It's taxed as inventory um, since I'm not making any improvement. So, um, See, you know, and I'm, time, I'm, I'm missing, I missed that. Yeah. So for the land flippers out there, which I'm not a CPA, not an attorney, this is what right, my right. CPA and my attorney have said, blah, 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 um, is uh, land is taxed as inventory. So I'm not paying any capital gains taxes on it. Uh, it's just inventory. So I have it set up as an escort where I have to pay myself a fair and reasonable salary. And then, you know, you know, I can buy land for a hundred grand, sell it for 500 grand and, you know, it's just inventory. Um, so pretty cool, pretty cool, um, you know, set up there. Uh, so that's how it's worked so far, um, you know, from a tax perspective for me. Um, but my investors are happy. And since you can't really get access to that institutional capital where, you know, I bought a new truck last year for the business. And uh, even though we, we business had been making money and stuff, you know, I had to have my wife co-sign on it and everything. And um, but that was a fun perk because I got to buy a new truck and then depreciate it fully last year. So, you know. Right. Yeah, those are those are those are those are excellent benefits to what it is that we do. So I like your ideas on money. I think the other thing is that at some point we all run out of money. And, and I think that's one of the things that early on, I was, gosh, what was the first deal I syndicated? 2019? Yeah, it was 2019. And there was this internal, and I was new to the newer to the commercial real estate space. And there was this internal sort of shame that I didn't have all the money personally to take this deal down. And it's like, oh man, like I got to go like bring friends and family and other people in on the deal. And yeah, I don't have enough of my own money to actually get this deal done. And now it's like, obviously it's what we do every day is raise money because we're taking down deals that, I mean, we just can't possibly begin to think about taking down. Absolutely. Well, you, you can't grow and scale. And what's going to happen is the inevitable of, you know, I, I was tired of that entrepreneurial life cycle where I'd, you know, go buy a bunch of land and then I'd go sell it. And I'd be like, man, I'm rich. And then I'd go buy a bunch of more land. And I'd look at my business checking account and it's like, dude, how did you allow yourself to get $12 in your checking account? <laughs> right. And then it'd sell and I'd be like, no, I'm rich again. And I just couldn't do that anymore, which is why it's like, you know, I, I'd rather be liquid. And then it gives me more opportunity to invest in, you know, syndications and other deals that are going to give me the tax advantages that land doesn't give me. Because even though it's taxed, it's inventory. Um, if you're making seven figures, that's that's a lot to pay in taxes. So, you know, the strategy is take that profit to great active business mm -hmm. and then take it and go invest it into, you know, depreciable assets like multifamily or like commercial building or, you know, any sort of commercial buildings or industrial or, you know, whatever it is. Is that the long-term strategy then to go take your profits from this and park it into passive investments and or your own personal passive investments? Is that kind of the, the, the goal in the long-term? Absolutely. Yeah. I've got, I've got one commercial building that I own right now. Um, you know, it's still getting renovated because it's in a small mountain town in Colorado, uh, but it's going to be workforce housing, you know, um, mm -hmm. mountain towns out here that they, they're struggling uh, to find affordable housing. So I, I enjoy that. You're able to help the community provide a, you know, safe, low cost, um, you know, opportunity that it's a rent by the door model. So you end up cash flowing um, pretty significantly as well, but yeah, so take the profit from land, uh, invested in commercial real estate, um, you know, the, the one thing I learned about my first deal was it's a lot easier to tackle those big deals than it is the little ones. So I'd rather go buy, uh, you know, however big apartment complex over a single family home or small multifamily. Um, so yeah, uh, take it, take it there. And then also lending money, um, you know, something I'm getting into now of, you know, investing in other people, um, you know, and allowing them to, you know, manage my money for me and then every, everything else and, you know, using it to go have fun, you know, go on vacation and, uh, all that kind of stuff too. Man, that's cool. I love it. There was one one more question. Oh, here it is. I forgot I forgot what I was going to ask you. What is like what's a, what's a challenge that you're facing inside of the land business right now? Like what's a what's an obstacle that you're like, "Man, this is this is something we're working on that I just haven't solved yet." Yeah, I I think for me, um, you know, kind of initial challenges and how they've evolved is so I I, I went from an executive you know, with hundreds of employees, you know, a couple dozen direct reports and everything to self-employed. So a lot of work wasn't getting done because I was like, man, someone needs to do that. And then I'd look in the mirror and it's like, oh crap, it's me. So I, I you know, figured that out and, you know, started working harder and everything like that. But I, th I think for me, it's, um, you know, effectively managing kind of what we were talking about of the volume businesses versus like the, the huge ROI business of, I've got a ton of those, which take more time. Um, and when I look at it and I'm like, oh, it's only been 
three weeks since that since I purchased that property, it hasn't sold yet. So I, I want more volume in the business um, rather than more of these big deals uh, to manage that more effectively, I think is one of the biggest challenges. So um, it's just adjusting my expectation of my cash on cash return per deal doesn't need to be 250%. Um, it can be 50%. And um, if I can move it way quicker, then then that's perfect. That's money. So kind of adjusting the expectations that I got from the first deal to make it uh, more of a volume business in addition to the, the other stuff. Right, right. And last question here for you. And this is again, going back to more the more the operations side of it. But how many of these parcels do you buy, if any, and then end up owner financing those? I, I only have a handful on notes right now um, of the properties. I kind of determine with the realtor, whether it makes sense. So it's more the, the rural recreational. I've got maybe 10 that I'd be willing to part ways with, uh, you know, from a seller finance perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I look at that is, you know, if I sell those on terms, one, I'd get most of my, you know, cash invested back myself. Right. Um, and two, that would sustain all the operating expenses of the business. So um, I think it's a more property by property approach uh, where, um, you know, it's just whatever makes sense for your books and your your risk level, um, yeah. you know, in case you have to foreclose on someone or or whatever. Right, right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Mason, you've given us a ton of things here to think about today. I love the land business. Uh, this is, yeah, this is a blast just hearing your story here and what you've done and how you've done it. And you've done it really with a, I mean, a, a pretty light team. It's you and one other person and you've got a rocking business. So I think that's, that's uh, fantastic. Thanks for taking the time to come on the show today. If our listeners want to learn more about you or get in touch with you, what is the best way to do that? Yes. I'm so happy to be here. Um, you know, for me, I use LinkedIn the most. So look me up on LinkedIn, Mason McDonald. Uh, and, you know, I, I help business owners that are looking to get involved in land um, get started. So I, I do coaching as well, but um, I only do it with people that I know are going to be closing deals and, you know, being successful. So typically you have to have been a business owner or an executive already. Um, so coachingwithmason.com. Um, and then, you know, you can message me there as well. And, you know, if you're looking for investing opportunities, diversify your portfolio, either of those places, and we can just chat, chat about land, uh, talk about land all day. So um, happy to talk to anyone interested. Sounds good. Awesome, Mason. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Sam, you do the same. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen. If you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.